Well, good evening. Hi, my name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm here for EdChat Interactive. Tonight's session is going to be your role in educating our most connected generation about digital citizenship with Eric Butash. Uh, Eric's coming to us, uh, compliments of FETC. He'll be a featured speaker on FETC, and, and you see on the, on the slide here that if you do register with FETC and you use the code EC, 1026 that uh, that you'll get a 10% discount on your registration fee and and let you start. It was the best and worst day of my life because that photo went out and it was never tagged with my name, which is great. So no, if you Google my name, you're not going to find that. But if you Google 30, Goonies 30th anniversary, you'll find this photo and just kind of, it's that image I give the kids is saying, listen, one photo can, can shape who you are on this, on this, in this connected world that we live in. So Mitch, if you want to move to the next slide, that'd be great. So when we talk about this digital landscape and this digital world, who are we, who are we talking about? Uh, there's two types of people in this world. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead, next one. Those two people, and we've heard this before, is uh, the digital dinosaurs and the digital natives. Now we know who the dinosaurs are and we do the natives. And so I put the slide up here because I feel as if some people feel as if they may be a native. I've, I, you know, we might have some young teachers out there who were in their 20s who said, you know, I grew up with some technologies, a Game Boy or whatever would be in their hands. But, um, let me just show you how our dinosaurs live uh, in this digital space. You know, I updated this photo, but most likely our dinosaurs like the fact that we can connect and use our media. We, uh, it, it's still personalized for us right now. And this picture captures each one of us doing our own thing on our own iPad. Um, and we actually sit down and we are very excited that we can DVR a program and watch a, a video. But our digital natives, uh, if you wanna go to the next slide image, our digital natives live in this environment where it's just not uh, when we one thing, it's multiple things. I, this is my son. Um, I snapped this photo, I snuck up on him. So in their family believe in screen time, you know, time limit, but not the number of screens they can connect to. But if you see in this photo, this kind of captures our natives that are out there. Not only is my son listening to Dan TDM, uh, some uh, Minecraft uh, gentleman, but he's also playing the game, listening to how he's navigating or listening to that, that, that video cast. And if you look to the bottom left, you can see that the screen is still lit from the text message that he just replied to from one of his buddies. So while this is this environment of you know, not just one device, but many devices and interacting and having that ability to do that. Um, these are our, our kids that are in our schools today, to some extent. I'm gonna keep going there, Mitch. So, you know, I, I put the slide up as real quick as uh, an intro because I feel as if those parents are out there, but uh, anyone, it's like, you know, how's your school today? And and so it's it's really like our stories being told in the social media platforms out there. And uh, this this image actually captures that, you know, it, it, getting that family time back is, is and having this conversation is one thing, but this parenting and digital age, because um, you may not even get the half the story, but the real story might be in that social media platform. And, yeah, and so let's let's think about this this connected generation and how life has changed for us in this, in this space. And I put this diagram up here because I, I I just to get us our ideas flowing here. Think about the days when we had there was a party that we we're getting invited to, and so the party invitation would come out maybe through a mail uh, invite, and you would either RSVP through a mail return or you would actually phone call it in, and uh, you would go to the party, you take a couple photos, and then you would get them developed, and then you would hang them from the fridge or hand them out. But now if you think about today and how we're connected, imagine now that the invite goes out electronically, we respond electronically, we show up to the party and then we take photos and we share them with our friends who are not at the party. And then we're able to have dialogue about those photos in a platform um, amongst other friends who are not maybe not close by or distant friends. And so we're just simply connected in this space where um, that we, and it, it continues to grow. And so this is where I get to our next slide. And our first question is, you know, when you think about our students and, and this digital landscape, this is my question back to you guys is, um, what, do we, what do we know about our students today and the digital landscape? How has this, how's this evolved for them in this, and how our students, when you're thinking about this digital landscape, why, and, and it continues to evolve, but how has it evolved for them? So if I wanna just, if we could break out and do some conversations around that. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd pop up here also. So this is the time for you all to break out into conversations. So if you have a webcam and a microphone, click on the avatar of somebody else and uh, talk about this question. Eric, I'll pull you down so that you can join in any of the conversations also. And then you can text me um, if you if you wanna come up. Um, but in, in, the, in the meantime, if you have a, a webcam and a microphone, click on the avatar of another person. If you don't, click on that text chat 
and start interacting with everybody else that way. And I'll pull myself down also, and then in a couple minutes, Eric and I will come back up. And what you'll find is, I'm gonna bring Eric up here in a second also, but as I'm talking, if you're hearing a reverberation, then you might wanna either mute your microphone or separate out from your group. But let me bring Eric up. Here he comes, okay. So did you get a chance to talk to people? I did, I did. I met Vincent from New York and um, Vincent was, you know, Vincent brought up a good point tonight. He was saying that this, uh, this digital landscape and how it's evolved is, uh, we talked a little bit about bullying. We just started to scratch the surface, but he mentioned something that the, the ability to communicate beyond our borders, right? And so the oh. connection beyond, and so he was talking about um, one, one of the games, a video game, basically, and a headset allowed him to connect with not only other, other kids, but other adults, right? And so in that connectivity piece for kids in that landscape, um, and, you know, someone could say something about somebody, you know, that bullying that happens, mm -hmm. not just in the schoolyard or the neighborhood or whatever it happened. Now you could have it across, you know, across the globe in some states. So that wow. was pretty... Uh, right. It was a pretty interesting in that landscape of that lens. It's just not micro that it's, it's, it's a world thing right now. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if anyone else is out there wants to. Yeah. So if, if you'd like to come up and share some, either some of your discussions or, um, or your thoughts on this, click on that raise hand icon and um, I'll swap you out for me and you can talk about it with Eric. It's actually fun. Um, I've actually talked to Eric before and I'm still alive and kicking, no, <laughs> nothing bad ever happened to me. Um, so um, ah, there's somebody with a raise hand button. Okay, so let Perfect. me uh, bring you up and, and I'm, gonna, um, I'm gonna bring you up and I'm gonna bring me down as soon as you're up. Awesome. Looks like and Susie, highly. Susie. Yeah. Blast off. Hey, Susie. Um, hey. Hi there. I, some oh. of my friends were at MassQ too. I wish I would have been there. So oh, you missed out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I was following along on Twitter. We talked about how the amount of access has changed dramatically. And for example, uh, even just a couple years ago, not as many kids had phones and now they have more access and they have it more of the time and so the amount has changed dramatically yeah it's a good point i um it's funny i did a social experiment with my own 11 year old um, he wanted an iphone for christmas last year and i said how do i practice but i had to practice what i preach so he's got a full-blown iphone with with access on it but for me to practice and see different tools that are out there to protect kids in the different age brackets so yeah the, the access is there you know, and I, I actually see when I go to schools now that there's some, uh, you know, the only access in the homes in some cases is that cellular phone, right? And mm -hmm. so that there is no, there is no cable modem, but that, that cell phone service, whatever they have is their kids access, you know, so That's right. it's a good point. Right. And it, it is continuing to grow. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hi guys. Hey, Tom. Um, one point I, I, I think has to be made though, um, when we're talking about adults and we're talking about kids. Um, too often we, we make assumptions that uh, kids know everything there is to know about technology and uh, unfortunately that's not true. They, they know how to text and they know how to download music, they know how to play games, but when it comes down to, to um, the nitty gritty of research, um, you know, being able to critically think and, and, and understand the sources that they're, they're getting information from, these are all things that have to be taught to them. Uh, we can't assume that because they are technology savvy that they have all of the skills necessary to use that technology properly. Uh, and and unfortunately, we've got too many educators who make that assumption today. So you move this. Yeah, thanks, Mitch. We're gonna move along. Yeah, perfect. So you know, I think some of the conversations have come up, and these are some bullet points I figure would come up for information that you know technology has been promising for learning and communicating. You know, our, you know, we just said about there's more access than ever at home and school. And, uh, you know, and the kids are not always aware of the, the long-term ethical con consequences of, of their actions and not even, you know, knowing how connected they truly are, you know, as we pr portray them. Um, I have some stats, some quick slides here to kind of show you how connected we really are in this digital space. Uh, Tom, Mitch, you want to go to the next slide? So I, I put these pieces together. So this is, um, and this is from 2016, but you can just see every minute, every day, if you look at the graphic here of what's happening on a minute, and you look at this, just Snapchat, um, people watching videos, about 7 million people, 7 million uh, doing that every minute. 
uh, uh, you know, you've got Siri. It's just the, the, the amount of data that's out there and connectedness is there. Um, the next slide too will list list is in billions how how much data is being generated every, uh, and I think it's every three point three point four billion last year uh, pieces of data being created uh, in this digital space. Now that gets us to this next slide of like okay. Okay, so we have all this information happening. Look at where we're at with our kids. And so our teen, our tweens are on devices six hours a day or some type of media use. And then our teen, maybe there's some people who have teenagers out there uh, are nine hours, you know? And so you're looking at the screen time is just on the increase. And this, this data is from the last 2015. So I can't imagine what the numbers look like uh, today. I'm sure they're on the increase, um, which gets us down to our next, uh, we have a quick little video audio pic clip of a, this is a feature, uh, someone that Common Sense Media interviewed. Um, she's a high school teenager, but she talks about how she connects and how she's connected to this uh, digital space here. And if you want to play just a quick clip, that'd be great. We're going to push this. My name is Alejandra and I'm 13. And like on a daily basis, I go on my phone like in the morning and I'll check my Instagram, Snapchat, Kick. Twitter, Tumblr, fine, go to school, and I come back, and I'll use like, I'll go on Netflix, and I'll go in my room, and I'll listen to like Pandora, Spotify, I'll play my Xbox, like Grand Theft Auto, and Call of Duty, and that's about it. If I would add up all, like, you know, the time that I use, I think I would spend about seven to eight hours every day. When I'm on social media, I, I feel that's like great, I Mitch. If you want to, so that's just a good idea of, uh, of a student speaking because I I feel like that's uh, the component. I think in some cases, as I thought about doing this uh, EdChat interactive, is I wish there could have been some students here in the audience as well who can you know offer their the connectivity piece. But it gets us to the second question here: is how do you define and model digital citizenship? And you don't have to put the model piece there, but but how would you define digital citizenship uh, amongst yourself or even your class? With your students and what does that what does that really mean to you um and in your definition so if you take some time just to talk about what that is uh, in your role that would be great so here again this is a chance to hook up with another person and um and answer the question how do you define and model di digital citizenship to your students and your faculty and um and if you can't connect with another person then perhaps you can type in the chat box so that uh, you can you can all re reply to that. I'll bring myself down, and uh, we'll come back up in a few minutes. Okay, let me bring Eric up here also, um, and here you go. I think so. Yeah. Okay, hey, sure. um, yeah, yeah. So again, no, it looked great. like there were some good discussions. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, just briefly, I met with Susan from Putnam County down in uh, Gainesville, Florida. Um, and so she brought up a good point. And so for those people who are in the IT director or leadership role in the district, or even everyone on, the, on here, um, there's a requirement, there's a thing called SIPA. And so when you take E-rate funds to help uh, supplement your internet access in schools, um, you must agree to this thing called SIPA, which is your filtering, right? But the back half of, of SIPA says that you must educate, right? So we do a good job of filtering websites. Maybe sometimes we over filter in schools. But the second component of that is really educating our students. And that's a, a requirement that was in that SIPA um, piece. And the, the real question is how often, it, how is that being? I think in their case, they had some, uh, they're, they're doing something K through 12 using a platform of some sort to educate all their kids. Um, but I'd love to hear from some people in the audience here uh, if you can raise your hands in definition or, you know, is there any hands up there? I so, um, yeah, I'm the one who actually, so I'm the only one who could see the raised hands. So yeah, if, if, um, if some of you could raise your hands, oh. then we can bring you back up, up on stage, raise hands being click the raise hand button, not, not, uh, not go like this, but on the, on the screen, there's the raise hand button. And, uh, I'm, unfortunately I'm not seeing a volunteer. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay. Well, we can. Thank you. Oh, we got one. No, here comes. Okay. Um, okay, you're up. Great. Uh, so I just wanted to shout out what um, my conversation partner Kay was sharing. She's an IT professor and a business professor in Kentucky, and she said that for her, um, with her students, being a digital citizen is not only thinking about um, 
being responsible online, but being conscious of how others perceive you and really being proactive in the positive um, social and even business interactions that you perform in the in the social media world. Um, specifically for her context, she mentioned uh, the LinkedIn profiles that she coaches her students around and um, how they portray themselves online. And a lot of times we talk about what Eric said at the beginning, like the negative connotations, but really building up those positive interactions in a, a conscious way as well. Great. Thanks, Maeve. Do we have any other hands that are up? Or are we gonna, yeah, we can move on. Okay, yeah, so this is how it common sense kind of defines, uh, common sense media for those not, in, or common sense education, uh, the nonprofit that talks about digital citizenship. Um, yeah, perfect, I'm so, yeah. So, you know, this is the, the quote is, a digital citizenship knows to harness the power of technology safely, respectfully, and responsibly. And, and then they have these bubbles. If you look at these bullets of points, and we talked a little bit these today is about privacy. We talked a little about risky situations. We talked about, you know, the credibility of websites. Um, and so, and, and in that bottom one, I think some, respecting copyright and plagiarism, I put that, remember I was talking about that modeling piece is how do we model this? But then we have this respect, copyright and plagiarism. And, and sometimes we're photocopying uh, textbooks and other, you know, in our, in our environment. So here's your seeking independence. And we also want them, the next slide here was, is really, the kids are forming their identities, right? And so this is what's happening in schools and you know, as, as teachers in, in different ways. Um, and in doing that, they're, they're actually forming what we call the next slide over is, is this digital footprint that we talk about, right? And so, um, I like to use tattoo. I mean, footprint seems to be like the Coke and the tattoo is the Pepsi, but digital tattoo, and we talk about that reputation piece and they're building it at a very young age. And so, um, you know, kids are, are made and we, we're, it's all about failure and, and retry and, and in education. And that's what we, we're teaching kids. And so when a mistake happened online, it's there forever. Um, I'll, I'll go to our next slide here. This is, and I don't know if you guys know about this. Oh, here comes Tom. Coming up. I just want to point that, point out that you know, working with uh, college students for a number of years, one of the things that that I always told them was that when they go interview for a job, they've already been researched by the people who are doing the interview, because um, finding out what people do through the internet, they're able to find out things that they're not allowed to ask in an interview. So it, it's it's very important that. Um, kids understand that that once they are on the internet they're on there forever so you know people who are going to um um you know bars for wet t-shirt contests or or um uh, at parties uh, drinking uh, if any of those videos are online prospective um um employers are are researching you on the internet to see the kinds of things that you're doing uh, they're they're looking you up on LinkedIn, or they're looking you up on on Twitter, or they're looking you up anywhere they can look you up, uh, and just knowing that you're coming in for an interview, so that they can find out the information that again they're not allowed to ask you in an interview. So so it's very important to get that across to kids, um, you know, before they, they they're in a position where they're looking for a job. Tom, great point. And uh, Mitch, can you make this full screen for me? This slide. Um, this is, and Mitch brings, it's a good, he, he kind of set the screen up right here. So let me, let me, uh, in 2007, 2008, uh, somewhere in that time period, some companies put together this database and they, and they a databasing company said, hey, to the government, the FTC, and, and um, they're like, the FTC, can we actually start um, scraping the internet and grabbing all public posts and putting them in a database uh, and, and for whatever reasons they want to do it. And, and, the, and the government said, yes. And so this company called social intelligence is one of many out there who has been collecting public posts and has been, has algorithms that are connecting kids, uh, sorry, users by name, by location, by username. And what they does, it, it puts it in this database, right? And so employers and our, and our institution, our educational institutions can subscribe to this service and really pull a social media credit report on each student. Uh, or whoever would be the future employer, they, and they can get a good idea. So, you, you know, you think about the resume, getting you to the university or getting you a job, they're gonna pay $99 and get this report, which is gonna actually do all the work for them, which is gonna say, here's my YouTube account, here's my Facebook account, here's this. And by the way, if you look at that box below, maybe I wanna kind of subscribe and monitor my, my current employees that I'm just actually uh, 
actually seeing what's happening, what behind the scenes that, that I, so I'm not, nothing snuck up with me. I can get alerted when Joe Smith down here has uses any of these words or the arrest word comes up and see when my, my if anything ap appears in this database, um, which, which is unique about this. And um, this is what I spend my time. If those are going to FETC, I'm doing an entire presentation on just this alone is that what this is doing is so kids who are actually 11 years old signing up for those social media apps and pretending to be 13 and post something publicly, whether it be Twitter or responding to a newspaper article, gets swept up into this database. And guess what happens seven years later when they're applying? Now that that log or that record is there under their profile when they pull that. And so this is this is happening today. And so I'm sure there's people in this you know, audience today who are like, I didn't know this was happening. Wow, I, there's actually a company selling this data. Yeah, there's not only just one, there's multiple out there. And so I wanted to bring this to your attention. So you as educators or district leaders or whoever there know this is happening and it could be happening even on your dime in school um, when you're trying to promote these things. Now, I spend time talking to kids about building a, a positive social media profile and, and, and getting out there and being on top of this and making everything positive. And, and so you're building that resume and making it to the next level. And so... Uh, and, and I'll get deeper into that in, at FPTC, but just to show you, this is um, where we're at for the footprint piece. Tom, I mean, uh, Mitch, do you mind kind of connecting here? Yeah, so this next slide's real, sh real, real short, but you can see that even our search engines, when you take two different students, and you can do this in your schools to, to tomorrow, you can do it with your own kids at home uh, if they had two different logins. When they look for the word boots, it's completely customized. Why? Because our search engines are knowing the user at the end and, and trying to customize those links to each user. And look at if you look at the word definition of boot in in, in cold search is only second one down, but in Lola it's the fourth one down. Not only that, in the, in the box to the right with Lola's search, you can find out that they actually know that she might have relationship issues with that how to give them a boot, and they, they, and she likes jewelry. So all these things are being mined and put back out there. And so we're building this social media profile and even our profile, our identity on this line, and the data exchange is happening. Um, let's go to the next slide too. This is one of the big things that's it's in, and this has been all over the news. All about fake news and our president talks about fake news and we all talk about fake news but now it, it's even more complex as the more and more connected and the more information that's out there how are we actually going to sort through and, and find out like yeah no it, it, it that's not what it is like my, my son sees a video and and this look at this video and, and this kid threw a basketball and that was clipped that way no no it's not you know it's one of those things that we have to teach the kids how to really know and source through the, the material that's coming out because as we know that there is uh, sources that are you know, obviously fake news, but other pieces out there and that's under informational literacy. So, um, those eight categories I put up earlier where this is where, where we talk about the umbrella of digital citizenship, like what are these topics that you, that you think students are, you're seeing students struggle with the most and, and why do you think that is? So like if you see the eight categories here, if we can just break out in little groups, take a look at some of those categories and the, um, if we can pull up some bullets or raise some hands and put some things in the notes, I think that would be a, we could have some serious conversation about this. Okay, pair up again. I see a couple of you are doing that and uh, you know the drill. And if you don't have a microphone, uh, feel free to type in your comments into the text box, into the chat box, so that other, other people can see it. I'll pull myself down and Eric will I, and I will come back up in a couple minutes. Okay, so again, it looks like a number of you had conversations and I hope some people had a chance to type in the text box also, although I can't see that. So, um, okay, so Eric, uh, again, did you have, I saw yeah. you were in a conversation as well. Yeah, Britt from uh, upstate New York, and I hope I have the right area. Britt was uh, talking that uh, she's a librarian and she's got her 12 year old in her, in her uh, computer skills class, but she was talking about the social aspect is what kids are struggling with. And, and honestly, it's the parent modeling that's where they're learning some of these social, you know, so it's, you bring the parents into the piece in this, and this is what, you know, we're going to obviously loop them in. But, uh, you know, so I think there's some struggle on, on, on communication and the social aspect. And, and Britt, if you want to raise your hand and kind of dive deeper, uh, we'd love to bring you to stage. Okay, so Laura Jackson also just raised her hand, and so I'm going to try to bring Perfect. her up on stage first. Okay, and then I see uh, another hand raised. So I'm hoping that Laura works. I know you don't have a, a, a webcam, or at least I don't see a webcam, but hopefully you have sound. Uh, so thanks, Can you hear me? Yep, there you, yeah. yep, there you go. Okay, great. Yeah, I just wanted to add on because Britt kind of reminded me of, of a little anecdote. Um, she had said that, um, you know, kids struggle with the social aspect of having their devices on them all the time and knowing kind of how to self-regulate and balance. And it reminded me of a story my sister told me of my 
niece who is in sixth grade and she does not have a smartphone and she was at like a social event in their town where all the kids were kind of gathered together in this park and she came up to my sister after not too long and said like can we go home this isn't fun and Jen's like what are you talking about all your friends are here and she said yeah but they're, they're all just on their phones and so even when they were together in an environment that should have been social in a traditional sense they were not really socializing with each other. They were socializing with other people who were not there or perhaps with each other through the device. Um, so just reinforcing that idea that it's not innate and kids don't know without support and guidance how to self-regulate. Um, you know, you can kind of, the pendulum certainly can swing too far and just struck me as a very kind of odd interaction that they would all be together, but not together. Yeah, good point. Um, that's absolutely true. Actually, I read an article, I wish I had it with me, about how um, so many teens today are actually so much safer. They're home. They're not out. They're actually at home <laughs> because they're on their devices texting. There's like less teen pregnancy, less kids getting in drunk driving accidents because they're not out. They're actually just communicating via text, which is bizarre. <laughs> but uh, there's the pluses and minuses to that. Um, so I think, you know, the biggest struggle I see in my high school is that um, trying to get them to communicate. Um, I actually started a makerspace this year thinking I was going to go all high tech and it's actually uh, mostly low tech. And I've got 12th graders making perler beads, uh, but they're talking to each other. So that's um, an interesting development that we've had um, in terms of that has nothing to do with digital citizenship, though. It's the actual the opposite yes, there. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that has uh, been my, my my biggest struggle is regulating themselves on their digital media. Sure. Great. Thanks, Brent. Yep. Mitch, any other hands are up? One of the things that I'm starting to see is, um, well, two things that I'm starting to see is, one, the students' um, um, written, their written skills are really being affected by social media and texting. Um, I've had students turn in essays that were complete text language and they didn't see any problem with that at all. <laughs> um, and so they're not getting, they're not understanding that that's not the appropriate way to write an essay. Um, the other thing I'm saying is this major de desensitized, you know, they're desensitized. Um, mm -hmm. To, to what it is to be a human. So sometimes, you know, I've had students pull up a picture in class and they'll even show it to me. If I miss K, check this out. This is so funny. And, that, and like it may be a picture of a person who's overweight, who has on something that's maybe doesn't fit them the right way. And, I, and so I always stop and say, well, let me ask you a question. Because, you know, it'll be somebody took a picture of that person from the back. And so that person doesn't even know that they're being plastered all over social media and being joked about. So I said, let me ask you a question. How would you feel if that was your mother? Mm, that someone point. took a picture of she was out at Kroger and she just ran out to go get some food to put dinner on the table for you and the rest of the family. And now she's all over social media and she's a joke. How would that make mm, you good. feel? They're like, oh, Miss Kay, you're always taking the fun out. I said, no, it's really important for right. you guys to, to understand that these are people. These are your neighbors. They're your sisters, your brothers. And if they're not yours, they're somebody's. And you have to get to a place where you totally, where you understand that it's, it's, it's only a joke if everyone's in on it, including the person in the picture. Other, anything other than that is a form of cyberbullying. And they don't really get that because they think it's just a joke. But it's I said, okay, well, you. let's say it was you. How mm. would you feel if you were, you ran out, you was looking really bad that day and somebody took a picture and said, busted and disgusted, right. <laughs> you know? And <laughs> right, that right. all over social media with people laughing and making memes and making memes. all these things, yeah. how it feel. And I said, that's cyber bullying, that's bullying. That yeah. that pushes young people to to do harm to themselves. Um, just something that simple with you thought it was a joke. So that's one of the issues we bring up, um, and the students really don't consider how it would make someone else feel to be a part of a meme. <laughs> so do you that's the do you bring that up? 
No, do you bring that up when the, in the before it happens, or is that like a react? Like, is that something you kind of showcase to your students, or do you? How do you when that that example you just shared? When it, it 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 depends. There is it, part of my curriculum. However, yep. to be honest, the, it usually gets brought up somehow before I even sure. get to it. Yeah, um, because gotcha. like I said, the students are always um, like the young lady, something as Brit said, they always have their phones with them. They're always on some form of media. So and and they they love to come talk to Miss K. So they're like, Miss K, check this out, you know. And then we have to have the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, right. I shouldn't have bought it to you, Miss yeah. K. I should have known you was going to make me think about what I was doing and why, you know, how I made somebody else feel. But right. you, they need to. That's great. Thank you for sharing. That's that's awesome. Tom. Yeah, it's, it's me again. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, there's um, research out now that, that claims having cell phones in the classroom for educational purposes uh, is not affecting learning the way they thought it should um they're, they're finding it's it's actually a distraction and, and my belief is it's a distraction because educators um are letting kids have a free reign with with these cell phones as opposed to giving them structure as to what to do um certainly anytime uh your phone is more on kids are going to go to the phone mm. so so i think teachers have to understand that there have to be rules and regulations and guidelines for the use of these phones for uh, research or phones for communicating or, or phones for anything that you're going to be using within the classroom so the kids understand um, how to use it and, and when it's appropriate to use it and when it's not appropriate to use it. Um, so, and, Tom, and you, must, you must have figured out what we're having next week, right? Because you know the title <laughs> of next week's session? is um should we ban cell phones is the wrong question and you're really raising the, the right point i'll pull myself down but i couldn't resist that that was so perfect well it's great i'm here for it. no it's good okay that's it. i'm off thank you <laughs> thanks and i know that we're up on we're up on coming up at the hour but i have one more question i'm hoping we get to here is uh the question four for you guys is so okay so we kind of laid the fountain work here we've kind of talked about some issues but we're I want to know from the audience here, where do you guys turn for your digital citizenship resources? And what are some of the best ones you've found so far? Um, and if you guys want to share that, I know I, I'm presenting some of the common sense themes here, but I think there's more out there than just common sense. And common sense kind of crowdsources some of those best informations too. So if we could have this conversation, that'd be great. Yeah. So what I'm thinking is at this time, you know, because if people have found resources, it might be best to share them with everybody is that instead sure. of breaking up into small groups, maybe people can put them into the chat box so that everybody can see them. That'd be great. Okay. That'd be great. And if, okay. if anyone is, uh, do we do a time to bring someone up the stage or should we? Uh... No, I, th I think, it, or we can bring people up on the stage and or you can yeah. read them out. Yeah. Um, well, actually, yeah, if, if you want to. Yeah, why don't we advance the slides? Because I actually put some resources in the slide deck here. So as they're putting resources in the, the chat box, maybe I can go through some of the resources here. If that okay. makes sense, Tom. And image. if anybody who raises their hand, um, if, if you have some really good resources that you want to talk about, I'll bring you up on stage so you can talk about it with everybody at the same time. So I'll, I'll bring myself down. I'll start advancing the slides and uh, let's... Yeah, so, I mean, obviously I talked about Common Sense Media, and for those who don't know about Common Sense Media, there is a scope and sequence to their digital citizenship curriculum, um, and it's outlined here on their website. Um, if you keep going, Tom, I'll just, you know, keep advancing there. That, you know, it is developed, the Harvard Graduate School, uh, the, the Good Play Project actually has a lot of this uh, research in, in, behind the scenes uh, for them, 80 Lessons, the videos. So there's a lot of research to develop in there. If you keep going, I'm going to, you know, every few seconds here, I'm, I'm going to hit them pretty quick. Um, they are standard aligned, as you know, Common Core, the ISTE standards, that's the old logo, you know, and the uh, school libraries there. So, you know, that there is, they're, they're available in three different formats. Their information is, they have iBooks. You can keep going, Tom. Uh, I mean, Mitch, the iBooks, the Nearpod. Uh, they also have these uh, printables too for your, for your help. And um, yeah. I actually put, if you go to the next slide, I actually started putting together some different um, resources for you guys. These are some of the best <clears> resources I found that get towards uh, digital footprints. So like, here's how to search people searching, PQ, digital right, footprint. to be to multiple people in about five seconds. Um, oh, there's Andy. Hello, Andy. Oh, hey. So, yeah, welcome, welcome. Can you hear me? Yeah, man. 
Uh, cool. So I just want to say the uh, Common Sense Media is obviously the number one go-to resource, but there's some other ones that some have a little more technical elements about safety and security uh, from the FCC, the FTC rather. So yep. the net setter of books are great for kids, but there's also some things about keeping your Wi-Fi secure. And then, of course, there's uh, Be Internet Awesome, which is a Google tool that's getting some publicity lately, and it's definitely worth a look. One of our schools has been uh, Common Sense certified uh, two years in a row now. We're pretty proud of that. But one thing that they found was they took those resources and they remixed them, and it sort of right. gave it less of a package feel. So I highly recommend you consider doing that as well. Yeah, I would agree. I think that's the it's it's a good starting point, and I think you can totally personalize that that experience. And it's deployed in multiple different ways. I've seen some of the lesson plans from fifth grade go up to twelfth grade. You know, some of those pieces. Um, it looks like there's some other people that some chatting going on. NetSmarts and uh, Learning dot com. Susan had put some of the resources in, there, in the chat box there. Um, Mitch, if you want to keep going, I, I got some more around. Uh, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure you guys know about this. The personal responsibility resources, good character, uh, visible thinking. And you keep going. There's one, um, and this is what I, I feel like we have skipped this sometimes. When we were on the high school level, it was a creative, yeah, creative credit and copyright, um, and and that's you know very powerful as the kids move on to the higher ed space. Um, and if you keep going, there's some here around global and cultural awareness. Um, and I know that's kind of a discussion point here. And so it's really, as we're a global nation, you know, educating kids about those, some more resources there. Um, and then if we keep going down, like this is, and Andy brought up a good point. So there is a recognition program that Common Sense has. It's the Common Sense Certified Educator in school and district. There is a plan for that if you wanted to do so, um, you know, those pieces. So any more resources, anyone would kind of want to um, hop up on and talk about some resources? Because I think we're coming to the, the kind of the end here. Um, okay, so we're, we're to the final question is like, uh, you know, how can you specifically promote, promote this in the importance of digital citizenship in your educational community? Like today we had this discussion, but what's, what's tomorrow going to bring? Um, is there anything that you can take back or start? I and mean, this is, we're really kind of building that awareness that, listen, I, I have a fire escape plan at my house that we go over every year at my school. Why? Because fire prevention week. Right, and so what are we doing in our schools to, that to push this education back to our parents in the homes uh, that they're in? And so, you know, so I don't know. We're up with three minutes to Mitch. I'm not sure exactly this forum we could do. Um, well, we can we can go a little bit over the reason why I came up actually because it dawned on me we went through those slides fast and they and yep. there are links in the slides. And I just want everybody to know we will email you a link so you can download the slides. Okay, yeah, so. So if you'd like them, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll send them to you. Yeah. And I've got a little, uh, I've got a little bitly that I'll, I'll drop the text box to the chat box. So you have those resources. Um, these are some that were voted upon. The ones I went through quickly were voted upon as some of the t top resources of this last year around digital citizens, you know, just resources they could use. Um, but this question is a key question. So yep. maybe a couple now of what? people can raise their hands and come sure. up on stage and we can get like a two or three person discussion going. Okay. Here comes, here comes Britt. Um, and so is there another person who also wants to volunteer, um, in addition to Brit to, to come up and you can have a three-way discussion or have a two-way discussion. <laughs> there you go, Brit, you're up. Um, I think one of the really important things that we need to do is really open up the conversation to, um, well, I'm an educator, obviously. So, um, to open it up to open it up to the families, get them into the school, make it welcoming and inviting and make the, the students a part of the process of saying, what can you do online? A lot of a lot of the things that I, cause I, you know, I'm Googling a lot of things like uh, curriculums for my lessons and a lot of things are don't do this, don't do that. But what we really need to focus going forward is what can they do? What can you do and how can you do it responsive, responsibly and, um, you know, and get the parents involved because they should all be part of the process. They should know what their kids are doing and they should be part of it so that they know it. I think that's at least a piece of the process, um, at least what I'm trying to do in my, in my community because I live in a very small rural community and I want to try and get them all involved in going forward with the technology because it's, it's not going away. It's just going to be more a part of their lives. So. And do you, and Britt, so in your school, this is, I mean, we get to this point because I know we're up in time here, but it seems like this curriculum sometimes falls on the shoulders of our librarian and media specialists in, in districts and schools. And in it, that it's more of a one off, uh, and I'm not that I don't want to coin the phrase dump and run at an elementary school level, but this, that it's actually part of someone else's job and it's not really 
you know, in, in, in through all of our teacher space. So I'm not sure if you could speak to any of that or is that, have you seen that in your space? Well, as it turns out, I think the, the guidelines just changed in our state. I don't know what it's like in other states, but um, there now, there's a business, we now have like a business teacher. It's now part of their um, business model as well. So um, or it's like business and home and careers got all smushed into one. And sure. it's now I'm working with that teacher to work on adding what I'm doing into that curriculum. And it's actually going to reach more students because I don't actually teach the entire seventh grade. I only see some of them. So we're going to try and reach out to everybody. So it depends on, I think, I think most schools do try to get this information out yeah. to everybody. I mean, you can't go forward without really touching this. Right. And I, I know that that's the struggle of schools with the one-to-one -one, and there's more devices in kids' hands in schools and the training before. Yeah. So Anyone else want to kind of join this discussion? Ah, here comes somebody. Uh, yeah, let me. I'll pull. I'll pull myself down, and I'll get Andrew up here. When we talk about technology, we like to talk about it being integrated into the curriculum and all that. But we've really come to the conclusion that digital citizenship is so important. We can't leave it up to chance that will be introduced in sort of the common subject areas. So we teach a semester-long course for all of our sixth graders, and then we reinforce things again at the ninth grade level in the health courses. Sort of coming at the angle of like living a healthy lifestyle, making good choices, things that are going to affect you physically as well as emotionally and obviously with career impact as well. Uh, I'm not sure how lower we should be going. We do basic password type stuff at uh, third and fifth grade. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm wondering how people are dealing with trying to get this either integrated into the curriculum or people struggling like we were at first to try to make it, you know, a full-fledged course. Because it's, if we say it's so critically important, how do we make sure that our curriculum is guaranteed for all students? Right. Well, interesting. My school is doing a district-wide um, programming or uh, like coding and programming curriculum. But I said, well, can we first start with a you know a digital like a, a like a technology where a technology curriculum must address digital citizenship, but also pro, um, keyboarding and um, how to format a document. And they were like, oh, well, they learn all that in the other classes. And I was like, well, right. I don't think they're, it's not, it's not um, organized enough where they're hitting every, you know, we don't know which kids are hitting which uh, benchmarks. So uh, they just went and skipped right past that. So it's definitely a conversation. It's uh, tricky for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think the, uh, the piece about it is, is that it's, it's such a big umbrella, right? And so I look at the people who are online, and so the, it, there's so many different areas in our education that um, we have elementary school teachers looking for elementary school resources. We had someone in high school looking for resources, but in the end, like we gave these kids, and I have this, I have this image of or a kid driving a car, and you think about our students today, and they, we literally gave them, a, here's your car, here's your keys, take off and drive, and we we can't rip the steering wheel from them. But we've, I think we need to guide them through this space. And so, um, and it's, and, and some of it has to be a, a learning moment. And there's going to be a lot of those in our schools. But I think the big piece is that it's not, it's, this coin takes a village. It has to be us in education pushing this conversation to our parents and to our community because we know there's got, there's no Mr. Yuck sticker. There's no program that's going to come out from the government just say no. It's going to be us in education that's really going to be the core to shifting in these mindsets and actually getting people to be safe and use it for these positive reasons that we know the power of good behind this uh, this resource and this digital space that we're in. And so. Um, there's a there's a sh short brief uh, survey here, and I appreciate everyone's time time and comments tonight. Um, I can be found on Twitter uh, Twitter here, and a, a small little plug for our per blended and personalized conference that comes up in April. Uh, we, we it's a really practitioners conference that uh, you should check out. But uh, for the most part, and I'll be at FETC in, in January. I'm not sure I didn't, I didn't put that on there, but uh, talking more about that footprint and that reporting and how that and how can you help as a teacher shape that footprint to be very positive. And so I really appreciate everyone's time tonight. I know this is a big topic. We can go on for hours on it, really. Um, but there's resources I buried into this, this slide deck that you can use at your own district.